This is the Colonel Rad Alert. Civil defense information will be broadcast at 640. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Y2K. How can we prepare? Stop a few of their machines and radios. Throw them into darkness for a few hours. We are fighting for our lives. My family must survive. Over five years, thousand gallons of gas, air filtration, water filtration. Coming at you from the frozen tundra that is East Central Alberta, Canada. Streaming live on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, Rumble, and Odyssey. Welcome back to the workshop where we create community, find freedom, promote preparedness, and share success. I am Toolman Tim. Today is August the 3rd, 2023, and this is episode 348 of the workshop podcast. Whoops, did it again. Workshop radio. I've only been rebranded for 50 episodes, and I still screw that up sometimes. So <laughs> good to see you guys in here. Hey, Byron Roberts, how are you this evening? We're going to open up with another installment in I Shit You Not, a definitive guide to prepper vocabulary. So tonight we are going to look at the origin of bug out bag. Now, again, with all of these terms, they all kind of have the same caveat. They don't really know who started them, but they can kind of trace the lineage back to where they come from. And a lot of prepper terms kind of developed on the internet through the early forums and that sort of thing. And a lot of them have their roots in military culture. So the bug out bag seems to be a combination of two military terms. Number one, bug out. That's likely originated in World War II era. They said some people think perhaps based on some 1930s cartoons featuring bugs fleeing an, in, an impending foot or a boot. Um, ultimately based on the rapid disorderly flight of bugs when discovered, particularly their scattering if several are discovered at one time, such as under a rock or a can. So that's where the term bug out came from and it eventually got kind of adopted into the military. Uh, I found quite a few references on the internet in the Vietnam and the Korean Wars, but it seems like it started in World War II. So that's bug out. Now bug out bag. Well, there was a, an item called a bailout bag in the military. It was called the bailout bag. It was an emergency kit that mostly military aviators carried. And also, it was the type of thing that a, a, combat, a combat vehicle emergency dismount would take with them. So when they would you know, have to get the hell out of Dodge, literally jump out of their Dodge or whatever the hell they happened to be driving and run. If they could only grab one bag, it was called their bailout bag. And so eventually the two terms kind of coalesced and became part of prepper lore. And that is roughly where they figure the term bug out bag came from. So Thursday night, let's get our sponsors out of the way. And then we're going to hop into our, uh, we got a couple of cool things going on here this evening. So first off, Fortress K9. We had Joel on uh, last Sunday for an interview. He is an inspiration to all of us. I love listening to his story. Joel Riles is, he's, he's a friend. He's a brother. I just, I enjoy his company immensely and I just love hearing his story. So if you're looking to add a little bit of inspiration to your ear holes, add the Protection Dog podcast to your feed and give it a go. Yes. So let me, I got to turn my light down here just a little bit, just so I can show you guys this. So I believe most everyone has got this month's patch of the month. So it's time to unveil dun, 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 this month's patch of the month. And it says, you guys ready for this? Guns don't kill people. The government does. So <laughs> there it is right there in kind of a uh, military green and a khaki uh, text. So if you're looking for that, We've got the link pinned in the comments, and it's also in the description tonight on the Shopify shop, but that's what you're missing out with the patch of the month. Everybody who has supported the workshop, we've got uh, quite a few there now. I'm pretty excited about that, but if you're looking, if you're interested to get signed up, go to patchofthemonth.co, 10 bucks a month, $100 a year, and you'll be all set. So that's it for the announcements. So we're going to open up tonight. I, uh, without the, hey, we got a fellow, another delinquent in here, Chris Dixon. Good to have you, brother. So since we haven't been doing our Saturday night shows, we've been missing out on some of our Stranger Than Fiction sections. And so I thought I would grab a couple of interesting articles that I ran across this week 
we'll have a quick discussion on them and then we're going to dive in not literally because i'd probably hurt myself but uh, we're going to do another installment of our empty container series ammo cans uh, or as i like to call it um the man's tupperware so let's see how we do <laughs> so i got a question for those who are out there early in the show this evening it's about solar panels so if you now of course some of you don't know what this white stuff is that falls from the sky but for those who live where the snow falls what percentage of power do you think you would lose if you didn't scrape any snow off of your panels for the entire winter. Now, if I had to guess, uh, I would have had a guess before I read this article, but I had a guy over last night, actually, the two guys who we just got a handshake deal on buying the business last night. So I'm stoked about that. We sat and we talked for a while and he told, told me about this new, uh, well, recently new study on solar panels and snow. And it had me kind of interested. So traditionally, the kind of industry standard is they say 20%. So if you don't, you know, get your frozen ass up on your roof and clean your snow off, then you're going to lose about 20% of your yearly energy. That's what they say. So of course, since, uh, you know, universities and colleges like to do studies on things like that, they did some digging in. So Nate, that is the, uh, Alberta Institute of Technology. I don't know much more than that, but they set up a study and I thought this was kind of cool. So basically they put, uh, they got one, two, three, six different uh, solar panels that they, they had uh, two arrays side by side on the roof of their flat building, but they had them at multiple angles. So they had 90, 53, 45, 27, 18, and 14. Just picture it. So a whole bunch of solar panels, bam, bam, bam. And on one side, they cleaned off every bit of snow on average over three years, I think they said it was 23 snowfalls they had to clear off. On the other side, they left the snow all winter. Now, the thoughts are you get most of your most of your solar power in the summertime, which makes sense. So even if you're losing some, the percentage is going to be lower because you don't get nearly as much in the winter. So rather interesting, but they showed how, of course, the steeper the angle, the more the snow would automatically slide off and whatever. But when it came down to it, after the entire year, they did this study for three full years, they lost less than 5% of their power for the entire year by not scraping the snow and ice off their, their solar panels. Now that kind of surprised me quite a bit because like I said, I had heard 20 or even 30% power loss over the years. And uh, yeah, that wasn't anywhere near it. So basically what this article says is, um, unless you're right on the ground and you can easily clear them off, the risk of getting on a roof or, you know, anything like that isn't worth the little bit of uh, extra yield you'll get. Yeah, 5% five, 5 on average, Chris, and it was actually less than that. So these panels, I, I can share, you know, what? I'll share the article here for you guys. So if you guys want to check it out, but it's a pretty cool setup. They just had an array of six panels kind of at uh, sloping angles. Now I'm sure there's variables they didn't account for, but over three years, sorry, it was 24 snow clearings on average, and it was four years. So I got the whole study wrong, but yeah, four years, 24 snow coverings per year. And based on not uncovering them whatsoever, and we get a fair bit of snow here, they lost 5% or less on every year. I was quite impressed with that. I would have thought it would have been way, way more than that. So anyway, uh, I don't know if that's stranger than fiction, but I was rather interested. Now, this is more typical fare of our stranger than fiction section. So let me read this headline to you. And I think you guys might like this story. I came across it earlier tonight. It was one of those special interest pieces from a local news story. Oh boy, this is a good one. And uh, it involves Seattle. So you can imagine where we're heading with this already. Man who bought residential firehouse sued by Seattle for using it. You ready for this? As a residence. So let me give you the gist of this story and then we'll quickly fly through it. But this gentleman back in 2012 saw an ad for a retired fire station in the city of Seattle. And they said, yep, totally residentially. Uh, so in here, this was the exact wording from the post in the auction that was written up by the city itself. And it said a unique residential dwelling. Okay, cool. So the dude went to the auction and he bought the house for $712,000. Uh, 
which seems like a lot considering it was actually his secondary home that he, that he doesn't really live in this one. Uh, he kind of bought it. So they had a place for the grandkids and the family and everybody to come together. Anyway, whatever they, he had uh, money to spend and that was cool. So two, three years later, uh, 2016. So almost four years later, he gets a letter in the mail from the city, from the land use notice of violation. Imagine that, right? They said, according to City of Seattle's violation letter, a complaint about the property had been received. A zoning inspector investigated, quotation marks, I'm not sure why there's investigations there, but said, and found violations of the Seattle Land Use Code. <laughs> so it said uh, he was ordered to discontinue all unauthorized uses, including but not limited to office and residence, because the legally established use of the property is a fire station. Okay, so the city sells a fire station, advertises it as a residential property. The dude buys it and renovates it into a residential property. All goes well for three and a half years. Gets a letter in the mail. Surprise, you can't live there. What the hell? Okay, so eventually he starts fighting with them and the city, <laughs> oh, oh wow, Chris says, there is almost a carbon copy of this very thing going down in my town. I'll share it in Telegram. Uh, it's too long to tell here. For sure, this thing happened in our town as well. And I'll tell you about that at the end here. So he disagreed with them. He said, um, you know, go pound sand. You sold it to me as a residential property. And here we are. So the city said, well, we are going to fine you $500 a day until you comply. And he said, go pound sand. And eventually the arrears climbed up to $400,000 because again, this is what the government does, right? <laughs> so he said, well, screw them. I'm going to get a lawyer. And he got a high priced lawyer who pushed the city around a little bit and he followed, he filed a lawsuit against them. And the city, instead of saying, oh, I think we're in the wrong here. They decided let's use some more tax dollars and let's counter sue the dude. So anyway, he ended up spending somewhere between fifty and eighty thousand dollars in legal fees. I couldn't find out. This was a few years ago. I couldn't find out whether he got those legal fees back. But what I did find out was the city of Seattle dropped everything against him because they blamed it on a clerical error. That back when they filed or when they first sold the property, they said, "Oh." Oh, hum, we didn't file the paperwork like we were supposed to. So instead of, oh man, uh, maybe looking into that, they decide to get their dander up like government does all the time and fight with the dude and threaten to take him to court, threaten to take his house, threaten to take half a million dollars from him, all because somebody was stupid enough not to file the proper paperwork. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Yeah, so um, <laughs> anyway... The, he, he ended up suing them for quite a bit. He claimed that his constitutional rights were violated because, well, in this case, he said they went onto his property without his permission, peeked in his windows to find out he was doing exactly what he was allowed to do. And in the end, they dropped the charges, dropped the suit against him. But like he said, somewhere between fifty dollars and $80,000 in legal fees. Oh, what a debacle. I couldn't even imagine. So in my town... Oh, man, before we moved here, so more than a decade ago. Uh, now, we have a really nice greenhouse in town now. But back, you know, 12, 13 years ago, there's a, a fairly well-to-do couple here in town. They wanted to build a beautiful, and the building is beautiful. They built the most beautiful greenhouse with a, a nice foyer in the front and living quarters and these really nice skylights in the whole beautiful building. They opened it up for one season, and I mean, it was going to be a going concern. They opened it up for a season and moved into it, and the town, I mean, this, this is way over an industrial park where it, it literally butts up against farmland, and they, they decided they were going to move in there, and the town got their panties in a knot and told them, nope, you're not going to do that, and so they said, screw you then, and they shut the greenhouse down, and they sold the building, so because the town got their panties in a knot... They lost out on it. So now instead of it being a nice going business, it's just office buildings for the local gas co-op. Absolutely. Well, anyway, there's a word that comes to mind that I'm not going to use because, you know, don't want to get canceled in this day and age. But uh, yeah, it is absolutely 
insane. I just, I don't have a clue. Anyway, you know, the people who are attracted to these kind of positions sometimes shouldn't be in these kind of positions. I think maybe what I should say is the people who want to be in these positions shouldn't be the people chosen to be in these positions. And uh, I think I thank my lucky stars about once a week that I didn't end up getting elected to town council here because I'm not really sure what I was thinking, but there we are. So that was kind of a fun little stranger than fiction section for this week. So let's dive into the latest in our empty container series. I kind of, it's been, I think about three months since we did one of these and I was kind of running out of good topics. So I wanted to spread them out. I got a couple of more coming, but uh, this one I was looking forward to. So I like to go down, you know, for those who have never listened to this before or this kind of thing, we just do a bit of a history on these you know, rather innocuous items. And then we'll talk about a bunch of different modifications or projects you can do with them. And then normally I'll go and I'll grab a whole bunch of accessories that you can buy on Amazon to upgrade these things, but there wasn't a hell of a lot of them this time. So let's dive in anyway. So the very first standardized metal ammo container. I thought this was kind of cool. It's interesting how many... Um, inventions or steps forward come out of military conflict. But the steel M2 ammunition can, or box as they called it, was adopted September 21st, 1942. And it was for the 50 cal machine gun ammunition. Uh, it replaced the uh, M17 50 cal ammunition chest and other earlier containers. I thought that was kind of cool. The M2 ammo can was designed to hold link belts of 105 cartridges for, four, for a 50 cal. Um, for the Browning machine gun, but was in fact also utilized for other ammo calibers and packaging. I think what happened was they found out it was pretty versatile and they're like, shit, we can pack a lot of stuff into this. <laughs> so it was, uh, the, the original one back in 42 was pretty close to what we deal with now. Steel material with welded seams, top edge hinge consists of rolled small tubes attached to the body in the box with matching pins that you can slide out if you need to. There's a metal bar handle attached to the lid by rectangular wire loops so that it can fold flat for stacking. I never really paid attention to the handle on ammo cans. I have a ton of them and it makes sense, but the way they flop in so nicely makes them perfect for stacking. Makes sense. A wire loop on the lip, lid end is engaged by a latch panel to clamp the lid down. There's a rubber gasket underneath the lid, which makes the box basically waterproof when the clamp is closed down. And then there's a wire loop on the back end that I never really realized for, and it is to mount the box to a machine gun top. Thought that was kind of cool. Hey, Chuck Peoples, great to have you here. So this was kind of a cool one. Now, again, a lot of times, you know, when we went back and we did the mason jar, we did the 55-gallon uh, drum, there was a lot of history on these things, but there really wasn't. I actually was able to go back and find the original patent for it. So it was used first in 42 in the military, and the very first patent for this was 1952, November 19th, by a dude named Samuel Hammer, and it was granted three years later in April of 55. The patent expired in 72, and it is now public domain, which makes sense. That's why every, uh, you know, Jim, Joe, and Harry under the sun has their own copy of it at, uh, you know, automotive and uh, that kind of stores. But this dude is a ghost. It's all I could find. It was Hammer, comma, Samuel. And there was nothing else in the internet for that guy. So if anybody knows who that dude might have been, it would have been cool for me to dig a little further. I did a ton of digging and I just couldn't find it. But I'm thinking, you know, what better name than a guy named Samuel Hammer to have invented the ammo can? I was thinking, uh, you know, if he was in the army, we'll call him Army Hammer. But there we are. But that was it. That's all I could find about him at all. So... Uh, early on, the use of ammunition containers um, back in the ancient times were wood crates or barrels. I really couldn't. Hey, uh, Blakesley Acres, good to have you. But yeah, they used wooden crates and barrels to store and transport gunpowder and then ammunition from there. Um, and they were they were basic and uh, not very durable. If you see some of the early on, I, they probably got 
the the whole idea for the ammo can from the early wood containers. I found some from the 20s and 30s online. There was a Canadian uh, Royal Military Museum online you could look at. They had really nice wood ones that looked just like the metal ones, but they had rope handles on the front and back. But uh, they've had, well, I mean, these ones held up pretty good. But I'm sure, you know, they weren't waterproof. They could break easy. They could rot. They could catch fire. A whole bunch of things. But uh, so I found uh, during World War I, armies began to use some metal containers. Uh, they were usually made out of steel. And uh, it was made it very easy to um, transport ammunition. And even as early as World War I, they were starting to put a rubber gasket around the uh, inside to keep them semi-dry. And we're just going to shout out to, I, I want to say this is Blakesley Acres. I don't think I've seen them in our live stream before. So it, welcome to the workshop. And uh, yeah, fellow delinquents, say hello. It's good to have you here. And if you have been here before and I missed you, well, welcome again. So <laughs> World War II, the use of metal ammo cans became standardized, like I said. Um, they started introducing some 30 caliber M1 ammo cans. Um, they became a common sight on the battlefield. These cans were designed to hold various types of ammo, rifle rounds, you know, and on the front and back, they typically had the ammo type lot number on there to make it easy for identification. I always thought they were just cool when I'd pick them up. I'm like, hey, that's kind of neat. But And then post-World War II, there was quite a bit of writing about how they were working toward making plastic and um, composite ammo cans, but I just didn't find a lot. The, the main, and maybe some ex-military people, if anybody's in here tonight, can talk about if they've seen any plastic or composite ones in the military use, in regular use, but the only plastic ones I've really seen are at like Harbor Freight or Princess Auto, uh, Canadian Tire, when they have those, you know, they're made by Plano and that sort of thing. Uh, you know, they said they've been working to reduce the weight, enhance durability, that sort of thing. So I couldn't find much, but I did find something cool that I hadn't seen before. Maybe you guys have heard of this, but I, I ran across a, uh, it was an article from 2019. Check this out. They said recently, the there's this company that has been designing composite casings for ammunition. 30% lighter. The U.S. military was supposed to start testing it in 2021. They, they were going to ship around a, a million rounds to them to test them out. And they looked like a white plastic, but they were some sort of polycomposite material that was every bit as strong. It didn't transfer heat nearly as bad, so you could pick them up almost instantly so they weren't hot when you were using them. Recyclable, and somehow you could still pick them up with a magnet. They look rather interesting. I haven't seen them out in the real world yet, but uh, again, made out of a composite uh, poly blend. Well, kind of cool. And so... They kind of eventually standardize on these four different types of ammo cans. You see, um, quite often there's, you know, two or three standard sizes at most of the Army Surplus stores. But they had the 20 mil. It holds uh, 1,500 5.56 rounds or 7.62 rounds. It's about 19 inches by 8.5 by 14.5. Then you get your 40 millimeter. That holds 32 40 millimeter rounds. If anybody's got a 40 millimeter out there, I'd love to get my hand. No, I'm just <laughs> uh, 18 and a quarter by six by nine and three quarters. Then you get your 50 cal can that seven and a quarter tall, 11 long and five and three quarter wide. And then you get your 30 cal ammo boxes and that's 10 long, three and a half wide and seven high. So um, always fun seeing them stacked up at a store and that sort of thing. So when you go into, uh, when you look at the different uses for ammo cans there's always it doesn't seem to be a week goes by on youtube that i don't get some sort of video build this in an ammo can or build that in an ammo can so i got 49 because i didn't want to do 50 49 little projects or things that you can turn an ammo can into so let's go through them uh you guys throw your if you guys have any of you have done any projects with them put them in the comments uh brian from the lots project great to have him uh, he sent me a really cool one, actually. Uh, it was a, a TikTok from Josh Sheehan. He, I haven't seen him around a whole lot, but he he came out of the TSP community and uh, looks like he started a second YouTube and TikTok channel, but uh, his was Gander Flight, I believe. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, Chuck will like this first one, but this one was just a, a portable first aid kit. And really what most of these ideas boil down to is have container, fill with stuff, 
used for something. There are some that involve modifications, but mostly it's, you know, um, things that you wouldn't necessarily think about at first. But the first one's a portable first aid container. And the beauty of them is they just don't get wet inside. So you can take them, you strap them on the back of a boat, put them, uh, you know, on your motorcycle, that sort of thing. And they're not going to get wet. And if you want to store materials in there long term, just throw a little desiccant packet in there. Uh, I've had stuff stored in a couple of ammo cans for well over a decade now. And I just, I think I grabbed a couple of those little desiccant packages out of shoe boxes and they've held up really well. But um, what's nice about that is, you know, it's grab and go. It's um, a cube shape so you can pack it in somewhere and again, throw it around and you don't have to worry about it. Just stack it with the bare essentials and you're good to go. The next one was a solar charger for small electronics. And this was, there was quite a bit more involved in designing these, but they were kind of cool. Basically, it was a battery and a charge controller uh, with, you know, uh, requires drilling and putting some buttons and that sort of thing in. And then you just run a inexpensive Harbor Freight or something else solar panel on there. Uh, I would have said Harbor Freight for just about anything, but wait till you guys see my video tomorrow because uh, <laughs> let's just say that the Harbor Freight solar panel I do tomorrow for a test was a huge failure. That's uh, kind of sad. Uh, Chuck People says, uh, keep your medical supplies from dry rot as well. Oh, that's a good idea. Protects contents as well. Keeps them clean, which is great importance. You always forget about dry rot. I never thought about that, but that must come from just being exposed to the air, I assume. But yeah, that would, yeah, it keeps it an airtight and moisture reduced environment for sure. But yeah, solar charger for small electronics. Number three is a, mil a mini outdoor grill or stove. Now, that's kind of cool. But <laughs> but it um, here's the thing. You want to burn all that paint off before you get started. I've been warned by many people in the workshop whenever I'm doing projects. Uh, make sure you burn the paint off of your or the galvanized coating off your stove pipes. You know, make sure you, you don't solder with the garage door closed because I am forever doing shit like that. I uh, one time was washing out my homebrew bottles many, many, many years ago. And I was using way too strong a bleach. And what I was doing was I didn't have a, a, a tap where the bottles would fit under. So I was rinsing them off in the stand-up shower. And after, you know, five minutes or so, my eyes and my throat were all starting to burn because I was too much of a friggin' idiot, didn't ventilate, was in an enclosed space with bleach fumes for way too long. So <laughs> uh, Chris Dixon says a farrier's forge and tent stove. Also use them to store all kinds of tools, first aid and goodies in the pass-through compartment in the camping trailer. Great idea. Brian says 10 millimeter sockets. Now, either he's saying he's going to buy an entire ammo cans worth of them so that he'll never lose them, or he's the dickhead that's been stealing from everybody for all the years and he collects them in a ammo can. And it could be both because I know Brian personally and this is the type of shit he would do. He says, uh, Chris says, also line the bottom of the fire brick if you're going to have a fire in it. That makes sense. But yeah, so you can, you can turn it into a mini outdoor grill or stove. But like we said, burn that paint off before you go. Uh, this one was kind of cool, but it was a, a Bluetooth speaker or portable music player. And again, it was um, depending on how crazy you wanted to get, but you, you put a couple of aux inputs on the outside or <laughs> how much is that in Freedom Unit sticks and said. Um, and then you just put your speakers through the front. Take modifications, a, a multi-tool, one of my favorite, you know, the... Uh, the DeWalt one I use all the time would be great for that. But yeah, not bad. Um, this one was an ammo can toolbox for the garage. What I end up having problems with is <laughs> miscellaneous tools. I actually had to get the missus out with me a couple weeks ago. And we finally did a deep, deep dive into cleaning up my garage because I had been doing, uh, what, what do you want to call? Just kind of a surface level clean and organization for a long time. And what ends up happening is I have these entire five gallon buckets full of random tools that I would get. I'd go to a bank property. Oh, that's nice. I'll keep that. You know, I don't really need four 13 millimeter wrenches, but I can't get rid of them. So this kind of thing would be a good place to put them. And then when they get too heavy to haul away, just kind of slide them under the workshop and forget or under the workbench and forget about it. Uh, this one was kind of cool. Battery storage container with separators for different sizes. Now you can actually buy them or you can 3D print them. We're going to talk a little bit more about some 3D printable accessories in a little bit. But uh, I we I actually use mine for some, we have leftover antibiotics. 
leftover painkillers, that sort of thing. We put them in Ziploc bags and then put them in the ammo cans, and they've been in there for quite some time. Uh, we were keeping them in the freezer for a while, but they were a great place for that. Um, oh, that's a good idea. Uh, Lots of projects says we keep all the bug spray and thermal cell, thermocell stuff in one. That would be great because I lose that shit all the time. Becky's like, uh, can you refill this? I would if I could find what I did with them. Uh, next is a survival kit with essential items. Uh, this could be if you're, you know, going uh, overlanding with a Jeep or something like that, or you just want to throw something in the box of your truck. But the cool thing, again, is you don't have to worry about it if it's exposed to the weather. But you could have, you know, all of the different things you need in there. Uh, the next one's a fire starter kit. So you could put some uh, dry, some tinder, some matches, some homemade fire starters, keep it out of the rain. So you could be hiking. I know I wouldn't really want to haul too many ammo cans with me, but if you had it on the back of a quad or a side by side, something like that, you could keep yourself, keep everything dry for starting fires. That wouldn't be bad at all. One that kept coming up website after website. And I don't know if anybody out here does geo, uh, like geocaches or not, but they said tons of people use these ammo cans for uh, geocache containers. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, I don't know if they bury them or if they just kind of leave them there. But again, it's something that can be exposed to the weather. Uh, some of the reading, there, there's actually websites that had, you know, uh, care and repair tips for ammo cans. But they basically said, if you continuously paint them so that rust can't get a hold of them, they'll last forever. That's really the only maintenance you ever have to do. Uh, next, uh, fishing tackle box. And that seems to be one that comes up in every single empty container episode we do. <laughs> but yeah, it would work. You could build little dividers. You could get trays for them. You could print trays for them. But it would work. It'd be, uh, and it's about the right size. And again, if you dropped it in the water, uh, the I don't know if it would sink or not. But anyway, um, I guess it depends on what's in it. But yeah, that would work. Seed storage. Great one because it's going to keep them dry. Stephen Keen, great to have you. Rock on, he said. I always love seeing him in here. What a great supporter. Great. Good to have you over on Facebook. I appreciate you, brother. So seed storage. Now, we haven't been gardening in the last couple of years, except in our raised garden bed. And Becky will tell you stories about how much uh, she loves that. But for many years, we kept a lot of seeds around. And ammo cans are great for that because where do you need to keep Seeds, but in a cool, dry, dark environment. And what are you going to find inside an ammo can? Well, a cool, dry, and dark environment. Uh, ammo can, emergency car kit with essential tools. Not a bad idea at all. The one thought I had about that was, and it's going back to the oil patch days, we would have uh, random safety audits from uh, guys that did safety instead of doing work. And they would occasionally get after us for having loose items in the back of a truck. And that makes sense. You know, we would have like our fire extinguisher instead of stashed underneath the, the, the seat, we'd have it sitting up on the seat or something like that. And they were always concerned that it would become a missile in a rollover or something like that. So legit thought, I try to keep all of my stuff stashed away under the seat so that um, I guess the seats would have to flip up in order for them to come out. But just something to think about. Uh, the size of an ammo can would be kind of prohibitive to keep some of that stuff in there. And uh, yeah, he said uh, that thing would become a projectile if not tied down. And yeah, it absolutely could. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to deal with it. I, you know, I always bust the safety guys balls, but I used to do quite a bit of safety just about everywhere I ever worked. I was on the safety committee because, you know, as long as you're not a dick about it, it's pretty important. I think, uh, what do we got next? Pet food storage container. Another great one. I mean, a lot of these are great if you just have a bunch kicking around. I, mean, I probably wouldn't go out and buy an ammo can simply to, you know, hide my food from my fat chihuahuas or anything like that. But if I had one, it would work great, uh, especially for, you know, if you only had one <laughs> or if you just had a kitten that you were feeding, that sort of thing. But it would be a, a nice way. And uh, there's ways to lock them, too. So say you wanted to put medicines like pet medicines or I don't know, maybe your mouse or rat poison. That wasn't in the list, but that would work as well. Uh, ham radio or communication equipment container. Again, you can make radios in them. But for me, I actually have an ammo can full of my Baofeng radios, extendable antennas, backup batteries, adapters that take batteries, um, the coax cable, pretty much anything that's ham related is in one ammo can. And they've been in there for longer than they probably should be. But again, it's a good spot to keep them out of the way and in, um, you know, weatherproof conditions. 
uh, a travel toiletry kit for on the go. What I was thinking about was putting, I think, two rolls of toilet paper in there would be really good. So my my cousin Roy, love him to death. I don't know if he listens to the podcast, but he's always commenting on my um, TikToks that I put up. And they have a hunting camp that uh, his father, my uncle, own. And we used to go back there quite a bit. He goes back all the time. And they've done renovations. But unfortunately, it's uh, about a f- half hour to 45 minute walk in the woods. So there's there's no indoor plumbing. So you have an outhouse. But a ammo can would be a great place to hide your butt fluff or shit tickets in. Because, uh, yeah, you could keep your toilet paper in there. Mice ain't going to get it. Moisture ain't going to get it. Uh, yeah, it would work really, really well. Um a picnic set with plates and cutlery. Boy, that one, I saw pictures of it. You'd have to use the tall ones, but I don't know if you'd have to have friggin' like baby, baby size plates or something, but it, I don't think it would work that good. Um, a mini tool chest for crafting supplies. Uh, you know, I guess it depends on um, who, whom your wife is, but some would absolutely love to have an ammo can full of uh, supplies for crafting. But again, it's just one of those things. You could have a hundred different empty containers around to fill them up with things, but this one, this one works pretty good. A portable battery bank with a power strip. So this was basically just a power bank or an ammo can that you put a battery in. Uh, you can pull it out, charge it up, put it in, and then just run uh, a USB power strip on the front. So you can have a couple of outlets and a couple of USBs, just a, a poor man's um, power station, that sort of thing. Uh, next was an emergency USB charging station. They were pretty similar. This one was just USB ports and somebody took and drilled out really nice. They, they almost look like the 12 volt USB ports that you would install on a vehicle. Actually, I'm going to have a video on that coming up right away. And um, I just update, updated my standard 12 volt, what do you want to call it? Cigarette lighter adapter, hauled that whole thing out and put in a new uh, high speed USB C and USB A port. So any, you know, standardize on USB like crazy. Uh, Steven says, maybe you'll cover it. If not, check out uh, the DIY Bluetooth speaker. Just, just covered it a few minutes ago. But it's a cool idea. And especially if you're a maker or you're into tinkering and building things like that, it would be a cool one to do. Um, where, what do we got next? A shadow box or a display case for memorabilia. So this one was where they cut out the front and you can put a backlight and that sort of thing in it. Um, you know, not a bad idea. I could see some people maybe using it for like uh, pet urns or something like that. Or like um, my grandmother passed away last year and they sent me a memorial candle, which was really sweet. I ordered a, it was a um, like a neck chain with um, her fingerprint on it or whatever. So it'd be nice to be able to display that kind of stuff or whatever, any anything. But, you know, something that means a lot to you. Uh, now, this one was kind of cool. It was um, an emergency phone charger with a hand crank generator. And this I saw in multiple ways. I saw where somebody made one. I saw where somebody 3D printed the hand crank. I can't imagine that would hold up, but I don't know. And then you could buy pieces itself. So you could buy the hand crank generator, mount it through the side. It uh, kind of had like this old timey military radio feel to it. Uh, the next one, near and dear to my heart, was a mini bar set up with glasses and cocktail tools. <laughs> and uh, really kind of cool. Yeah, oh, so yeah, Chris Dixon says, bear-proof emergency food storage for the cabin. You could put a lot of uh, like high-calorie energy bars in there or some pemmican like we were talking about the other night there with Adam from Modern Frontier. That's a friggin' great idea. And it's bear-proof and maybe as important is it's rodent-proof as well. Not a bad idea at all. A mini sewing uh, or repair kit. I actually, for a while, when I was teaching myself how to sew, <laughs> I, I did keep all of my little knickknacks for sewing in one of those things. Uh, what do we got? Uh, emergency, or sorry, a ammo can camp shower kit. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to turn it into a shower head, but you can keep all of your shower supplies in there. So for like those outdoor shower things, just set it on the ground, put a little... I just picked up some of those um, airplane sized bottles for refilling shampoo because I know it's going to be hard to believe, but in my grab and go bag, I don't need a whole bag, a whole bottle of shampoo because uh, it would take me about seven years to use it. So I figured why not cut down on the size, but same type of thing. Uh, this was an emergency cash stash with a hidden compartment. 
the hidden compartment was kind of cheesy, but you basically just made a, a false floor or put some felt in it and put a little bit of cash under it. But honestly, if they find it, they're going to search through it. So, but again, you could use it, you could hide it, you could bury it, hang it in a tree, but uh, you know, just a spot to keep some emergency cash or maybe some of that shiny silver and gold stuff. Another one was a small herb or flower garden. That one was pushing it just a little bit. It would look pretty cool. I can't imagine Becky would want one of those on her countertop, but I could do it in a pinch. I'd probably rather reuse a, a margarine container or um, some of the uh, Tupperware or something like that. But, you know, uh, art supply kit. This would have been good for Charlotte when she was uh, going through her three-month phase where she wanted to paint everything. But again, what I like about it is you knock it over, you're not going to have oil paint all over your floor. It's going to be just inside. Um, Dixon says, if you keep wet stuff in them, you can spray the inside with flex seal so it doesn't leach through the seams in the event stuff tips over. Makes sense. I mean, they put a screen door on a rowboat with that flex seal stuff and it really works. Well, I don't know about that part, but it's good shit. I've tested it out before. Um, craft supply organizer, oh, a, a bike repair kit. So, uh, this was kind of cool. <laughs> I had a, uh, a cousin who is, um, He's always in a hard way. Anyway, we won't say who what his name was, but uh, just lived on the poor. He, he squatted in an abandoned trailer for many years, and uh, he used to strap the um, milk crates to the front and back of his bike. And I mean, he was ingenious with this stuff. And I could picture him taking an ammo can and strapping it to the back, you know, especially those old banana seat bikes that had that little rack on the back. They would work perfect. And doing some reading, I didn't put it, I don't think I put it in the list, but apparently quite a few people use ammo cans as a replacement for saddlebags on motorcycles. So another great idea. Uh, one I never thought of in a million years, but was a cigar uh, humidor. You can actually buy the little trays to hold your cigars in. And again, it's a controlled environment, right? So you could easily set the humidity that you needed that in there. A car organization kit with all of your documents in it. So if you wanted to make essential copies, and you want to leave it in a small ammo can, throw it in there or keep it in the house and grab and go when you're ready to go. Uh, a travel game kit with cards, dice, and small games. Uh, who was it a couple weeks ago was asking me about that? Um, oh, Ryan Pippen, I believe, about what kind of games would you take with you for a kind of extended bug out to keep the kids happy and, uh, you know, entertained? Well, this would be a good way. You could put You could put a small crib board in there. You could put Uno, uh, Skippo, a deck of cards. Yeah, what, what else would you need? So yeah, dominoes, you can fit a lot of games in one of those, and that would be great. Or put all your games in there and take them in the camper or haul them to the cabin. Another great idea. Um, a picnic cooler with insulation. You'd want a really big ammo can to turn it into a, a cooler, but by the time you do that, it's probably going to be fairly heavy. You could use it like if you just had a picnic table and you wanted to say keep a couple of bottles of wine or something chilled, put some ice in there and set them in on it maybe, that would work. Uh, a very small car detailing kit, again, not a bad idea. You could keep a lot of the small stuff, a couple microfiber cloths in there, maybe some kind of detailing sponges. I've been using uh, cotton swabs that I got at uh, um, Harbor Freight recently. Um, quite for, you know, getting all the, in the uh, heat vent crevices and that sort of thing. So you could keep a fair bit in there. Um, what else we got? Oh, a birdhouse or a bird feeder. Also a rather interesting one. I think that would look pretty badass. If, <laughs> if you got your little uh, cardinal coming and eating his seed out of a 50 cal ammo can, you'd be like, yeah, I got the best tactical birdhouse on the block. A uh, camera equipment container. Again, you can put battery packs, flashes, I'm not going to say film, but extra SD cards, an SD card reader, AC adapters, uh, your microphones, anything like that. It would all fit in there. You can also, we're going to talk about, but you can buy that cuttable foam that you can fit down in there. I'm going to be using something similar. I bought um, the Harbor Freight version of Plano boxes when I was at Harbor Freight last time. And I'm going to be using it for all of my AV gear to take to prepper camp and all of that. And I... Uh, Oh, Dixon says they make good birdhouses if you keep them in the shade, easy to clean out each year. Not a bad idea. Uh, I love this one, and I would absolutely love to get this. But they said to use it as a gift box at Christmas time. So 
you know, if you go and buy a bunch at your local army surplus and you give out, say, a bunch of emergency kits to the kids or you just need something to put it in, well, now you're giving them whatever the gift is inside the box and you're giving them a container they can reuse for their entire lifetime. Loved it. Uh, home brewing kit. So this was, you know, you could put your, your bungs. <laughs> did he say bung? Yeah, he did. And uh, so we said uh, you can put your bungs in there, your airlocks, your hydrometer, your yeast, your nutrient, any of the type of stuff that you just want to keep together. Because for me, whenever I'm into a hobby or I'm into something, what ends up happening is when I need all the little shit, it's like when I'm ready to go film a YouTube video for months, well, for years on end, I'd be ready to go set up and be like, okay, let's go, let's do this. Couldn't find one of my mics or I couldn't find one of my mic cables or sometimes I'd lose my friggin' tripod. So not that I could fit a tripod in there, but it'd be nice for keeping everything together. Uh, DIY tool sharpening station. This was mainly just to keep your, uh, you know, your oil, some cloths and a couple of stones in. But again, what I like about these is they just create a central location to hold everything together. A custom safe or a lockbox. I like that quite a bit. I've kind of used those around the house as that exact thing. If, if you do it right, you can put a, uh, if you have a long shackled padlock, you can kind of fit it in there so somebody can't quite open it all the way. But we're going to talk about an accessory that you can pick up that will allow you to um, make a better form of a lock on there. And then 49, this one was really cool. This is the TikTok that Brian sent me earlier today. And it was an RV sewer hose um, kit, not for the hose, but for the fittings. So when I first started watching the video, I'm like, there's no way he's going to collapse that sewer hose down that much to fit into an ammo box. But no, what he did was he took two ammo boxes and bolted them permanently using U-bolts behind the, the propane tanks in the front. And he used it as a latch down spot to put those fittings. I mean, you want to rinse them off, but you know, you've always got a couple of those bayonet fittings kicking around that you don't want to lose or uh, what I've been known to do before was shove them in the pipe or in the, uh, the bumper and then the cap will fall off and that sort of thing. So typically the hose won't fall out, but the fittings will. So it's a great place to keep them. And I'm always a big fan of using normally unused space. So that was 49 uses for the ammo can. And so I dug into accessories and like when I did the 55 gallon drum, the five gallon bucket, the mason jars, there was pages and pages on Amazon of stuff, but this one, there wasn't that much. So um, I did find labels, which was kind of cool. You could get printable labels that you could print on there, or you could just get uh, caliber um, uh, labels as well. So you could get like your nine millimeter, your 50 cal, that kind of stuff, but whatever. They were nice, especially if you have a ton of them stacked and you want to, you know, have a quick idea of what's in each one. And especially if you don't want to introduce moisture, you can just look and grab the one you need. Uh, cuttable foam insert. So that's kind of that uh, semi-rigid foam like we talked about. Um, most ammo cans won't work good enough for me to like put my microphone and stuff in. But if you had a lot of sensitive electronics or expensive kind of gear, you could slide them down, cut them out just nice, and it would work well. Now, I think my favorite accessory that I found was a screw through, I don't know how to put it. It's like a screw through eye hook or a locking hasp. So it was basically a, a long stainless steel rod that you drilled a hole through and it had a washer and a locking nut on the inside. And on the outside drilled through it was room enough for a good beefy padlock. And it made just a beautiful locking device for it much better than trying to you know kind of rig up or jerry rig the the idea that i had mentioned uh what else do they have oh um so they had pla plastic stackable trays that you could find so depending on how deep they were they could go three or four deep they sold those on amazon they were really nice because uh, they were something you could use to turn it into a, a bait and tackle kind of box or what I liked was somebody had a lot of their electronic parts in there. So if, you, if you're if you fixing up circuit boards and stuff, they had an area to put all of that in. Um, the humidor in, insert I talked about, but it was really neat. It was made out of wood and it slid down right into a normal 50 cal ammo can. And it would allow you to hold all of your cigars in there. I liked that quite a bit. Uh, another one was a gun cleaning parts tray. So this was... Um, they had empty ones and they had pre-stocked ones and you could buy them and they would fit in 
to the ammo can and they would stack up and i believe each tray was a different set of tools so that was kind of i like that um and then this one was really expensive and i'm not sure exactly why you would buy it but it was modular shelving to stack them individually so it looked like shelves individual shelves that would fit into pegboard or slot wall or that sort of thing or you could just screw them to the wall and it would hold a single ammo can it was made perfectly with sides i couldn't necessarily find practical use for me but i'm thinking the type of thing it would be is if you had it as a first aid kit or a grab and go you would always have it at eye level so you could grab and go it was expensive but it would work um and then there was a few things where people would uh, there were some 3D printed accessories, and again, I thought there would be more of this, but uh, one was a poker chip holder, which I thought was pretty ingenious. So if you were, you know, up to going to the, going with the boys and playing poker all the time, it was basically a plastic sleeve that fit down in, and it had the holes for an entire stack of each uh, denomination of poker chip. Uh, another one was a battery divider, so you could get one that slid down in, and it had room for your Ds, your Cs, your double As, and your triple As. This one was kind of cool, and I don't know if all drones would work, but this guy had actually printed a custom, I don't even know, like, it was like a storage sleeve for his drone. And so when, when the wings were all collapsed, the drone would fit in one side, the controller in the other, extra wings on the bottom, and it was, I mean, he must have spent hours building it. Um, and then there was even... <laughs> entire plans to print your uh, your own ammo cans uh, made out of plastic. Now, I don't know. I got to say, my experience with 3D printing was so-so. Most of the stuff I've had made for me or, you know, seen other people who have made, it just, it, it doesn't look like it would hold up super well. And I'm figuring by the time you printed an entire goddamn ammo can, you probably could go buy one at uh, Harbor Freight or someone else. And uh, it would be, yeah, rather interesting. So I don't know. The 50 caliber ammo cans are the ones that I keep around the house quite a bit. Uh, it was kind of a neat way to look at some of this stuff. You know, we all, I guess as preppers, for some reason, we just love to buy ammo cans, especially us guys for whatever reason. I'm sure there's ladies out there that do too. But it's just one of those items that seem to be on the shelf of every dude's garage or basement or reloading area. And we didn't even talk about reloading, but uh, there was quite a bit of stuff online about using it for, you know, storing your reloading supplies and that sort of thing. But yeah, I enjoyed this. Um, there wasn't quite as much this time. And it's not an apology. There just wasn't quite as much information dealing with ammo cans. And you would think something that was military based, there would be. But you know, that's what I had for you tonight, guys. It's a little shorter episode than I normally carry on, but you don't need to go longer than we need to. But uh, if you guys have suggestions for other empty container episodes, I think what I have left in my notepad is grocery bags, like plastic grocery bags. And um, they're coming hard to find up here, but I think we had grocery bags, maybe... Empty. Yeah, that might be it. Uh, grocery bags. There might have been one or two other ones. I'll have to look and see. But if you guys have suggestions for something that you think would make an interesting episode, and if not, eventually we're going to slide over into everyday items like your, um, well, let's see, what do we got? We can do the um, Swiss Army knife or the Leatherman, uh, maybe flashlights, whatever, you know, that kind of thing. Because I, I love taking a deep dive into the look of these. And uh, one more thing I wanted to ask you guys tonight before I close up. So probably by tomorrow, or the day after at the latest, I'm going to be at 9,000 subscribers for uh, YouTube. We got, uh, so that means at the rate I'm growing right now, six weeks and I should be to 10,000 subscribers. So we need to figure out something special to do for 10,000 subscribers. So if you guys have suggestions for me, I will gladly take them under <laughs> advisement and we'll see. But yeah, I, I want to come up with something, whether it's a giveaway or whether it's, you know, my crazy ass doing something absolutely foolish. But yeah, come up with an idea for me, guys, or we'll brainstorm in the Telegram group. But I wanted to throw it out there before I forgot because I don't want to miss. This is a big milestone that I am stoked that I'm going to hit here soon. So 
anyway, that's it for me. One more announcement. Um, tomorrow night I'm going to be on the road. I got to take Charlotte up to her. Um, I wanted to say denture appointment. What a night, man. My brain just hasn't been working the way I want it to. I got to take her up to her braces appointment. And Becky is, uh, she actually has bronchitis. So we're going to push the live stream off till Saturday night. Give her one more night to uh, repair and recuperate. And then I will, uh, we'll be on and we'll have our Saturday night live again, I guess. So anyway, guys, I appreciate you. Go over to the Telegram group. I posted two shorts over there. I've been running a new program that builds shorts with AI. And I want you to see if you can guess which one was made with by a human and which one was made using artificial intelligence. So with that, guys, I always appreciate you. Thanks for coming in when you could be doing anything else on a sunny summer evening. You choose to come in and hang out with your fellow delinquents at the workshop. So as always, stay happy, stay healthy, and have a great friggin' week.